Hey everybody and welcome to Ask Devin Anything on the Burn Boot Camp Podcast. And every Thursday I get to sit down with you and share whatever's on my mind uh, that you ask. So I have a bank of questions that you've submitted from Instagram and YouTube and uh, email and DM. And I've been able to curate that list alongside my team. And this morning, as I was thinking, I was driving in knowing, knowing that we were going to film this today, I was thinking about, all right, what, what real life practical tactical advice could I give those of you out there who are either in a small business, you're an entrepreneur thinking about starting something, you're a hired gun, you're number three, four, five, six, leading your company, and you guys have big big goals this year, or you know, you're in an organization and we all know if you follow me for any amount of time that leadership is a choice and not a title and you have the opportunity to start acting out these behaviors right now and, and stepping up and being a leader for your organization. And I've had a lot of experience over the last 10 years, natural born entrepreneur, I have it in my DNA, but at the end of the day, that was just a tendency. And then I needed to uh, sharpen that tendency, um, or take that tendency rather, and then build tactics and skills and strategy around it and be able to sharpen it over time. And so I don't want to start this podcast off on the Ask Devin Anything show to say, you know, hey, here's like the three things that most people would talk about when they say, hey, give me some business advice, right? It'd be like, hey, follow your dreams, do what you love. It'd be like, don't do it for the money, do it for the impact. And it would be something like, uh, build a team, don't build a job for yourself. Something like that, right? Like those are the, there's probably like 10 other things that you could find out there. And I wanted this to be more tactical, right? Strategic. Um, and you know, I'm living this every day. I'm operating the business every day. I'm the visionary of Burn Bootcamp right now. Uh, We have 12 companies. We just updated our organizational infrastructure. There's 12 companies that roll up into uh, kind of the enterprise is what we call it, and from every level, from a media company that's almost like in the startup phase, um, around a couple million dollars in sales, and then you have you know Burn Bootcamp, this big entity that we're shooting for 200 million at the end of this year in 2022, going into 2023 even more. So it's like, yeah, we've got big companies, we have small companies, we have startup companies, we've had companies that failed, we've had uh, plenty of companies that that have failed, by the way, and and you know my job as the visionary has always been to just be an innovator and and keep pushing the mold forward, and you know you have a DNA of an entrepreneur and you sprinkle a little bit of like fun within innovation, like you have fun with the innovation and you're an entrepreneur, you got that DNA, then it's like, all right, it's game time. And so I was 24 when I found that recipe and I've been sh- sharpening these tactics ever since. So I have three pieces, uh, three tactical pieces of business advice for small business owners, okay? And I had to write them down just so I didn't forget them. Uh, but you know, when I nowadays I used to have to sit down and think about things for an hour to you know to be able to come up with the concepts. But nowadays it's just super quick. And so I wanted to keep this quick and punchy. Three things uh, with a couple bullets in each one. So number one is don't try to get out of the weeds too soon. The number one thing I hear our franchise partners doing, my small business owner friends, is they're like, hey, how do I get out of the weeds? I want to be out of the weeds. It's like, okay, number one, you haven't earned to get out of the weeds yet. Like you haven't put in the work. You don't have the scars. You don't you haven't built up the 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 uh, calcification, right? You don't have the hard head, right? And the open heart yet. You don't you haven't figured out that combination. You don't know how to do that yet. I think you should try to understand every role that's in your company or any role that's in your on your team so well that you could do that job if that person had to leave or was sick or was out or happened to go to a different company, you could do that job. This, the days of like managing where your head is in space all the time or in the stars all the time trying to see the vision, those days are over. It's too competitive of a marketplace, you know, and the uh, visionary such as myself, the way I think about it is I have to live on the edge of the brand. I've gotta be out at our locations, with our members, on sales calls with our media team, on pitches, on project pitches. You know, I need to be in all of the meet, not all of the meetings, but I need to pop into meetings and I need to hear what's going on and I need to keep my open door and I need to go actually, not just keep an open door, but I need to go seek out uh, my team and go seek out their input and their problems and what they're dealing with and those issues and really try to understand what's going on in the organization. And so like I think the modern day entrepreneur has the ability to see the vision but also know where they need to be in the detail. 
I don't think I think the days are over where you can just be isolated into into, into one side just because of the near competitive landscape. It's like just being a visionary and thinking and dreaming big all day long is going to get you nowhere if you can't execute. And just executing with no vision, you're just gonna execute yourself in a circle like a dog chasing their tail and you're gonna mistake movement for progress. You're not gonna go anywhere. So I always like to say this. I actually said this uh, two years ago after I read a Howard Schultz book. If you have followed any of my content for any period of time, especially over the last couple of years as Burn Bootcamp has started to how do you say, uh, prove itself in the marketplace, I start to think bigger because of that social proof and what other people are asking me, like how big are you gonna take this thing now that you can basically take it as big as you'd like to take it. Um, and so I try to go out and find some role models that could guide me along that route. And Howard Schultz obviously is uh, the CEO of Starbucks and this guy has just come from nothing just like me. I so resonate with his story. And then he has built this company up to be, you know, uh, really, really the icon of American brick and mortar uh, service based um, service based consumer food. So I have really tried to emulate that. And I read a chapter of his and it said he got up in front of like thousands of people as he step as he took over Starbucks, it was going through some turmoil in like 2008. They had to shut down thousands of locations. He basically said, all right, we're shutting down every single Starbucks in America. I'm calling all of the district managers in, all the store managers in. He had a meeting with 10,000 people. All the stores were uh, shut down. It cost them like millions and millions of dollars to make this decision. He brought everybody in, um, you know, and he kind of fell on the sword and he said, hey, listen, the reason that Starbucks has had turmoil is because our because myself and the rest of our executive team has taken their eye off the ball. We've taken, we've, we've, focused on growing and vision so much that we forgot that the detail is so important. And they ended up closing thousands of stores, spending millions of dollars to send that message. And my message to you is today, don't ever get to that point, all right? Just make sure that you're paying attention all the time. You know, be able to see the stars, but also be able to play in the sand at the same time. So that's very important. Number one is don't try to get out of the weeds. I'm still in the weeds 10 years in. Now I'm in the stars more than I'm in the sand nowadays, but I'm st I still, I, like I can do anything in our organization. If you wanna put me upstairs as a burn ambassador here at our flagship gym at Lake Norman and you ask me to be up there all day long, it'd take me the first couple camps to really get my rhythm, but I would figure it out and I would make it happen. If you ask me to make you a smoothie, I got you. If, I, if you need me to train a camp, oh, no problem. You already know I have that. If you need me to you know, build you a website, I don't know how to code, but I'm resourceful enough and I know what we would need to go out and make sure that happened, right? So keep your head in the stars and keep your, your, vision, your, your vision focused on the future, but don't forget, hey, you need to know every position in your organization uh, enough to be dangerous, I think, is a good way to think about it. Number two, this is another piece of tactical advice. Remember, going back to the reason that I'm making this episode is because I searched Google and YouTube for business advice, and it's just like the same things iterated over and over and over. And that's it's good advice and it's high level advice. But remember, we're in the we're in this tactical area. We're in this like strategic area. Number two, since business is all about building a team and leading a team and hiring people that are much smarter than you or surrounding yourself with people that are much smarter than you and then getting those people to work together. That's literally my job, that's what I think I am. I think that I am a facilitator of an intelligent community with a common goal and a common objective to get to one place and one place only and that is the mission of the company, right? 10,000 locations to the moon, everybody's playing that game, okay? But the game I can't play is because I know how to do a lot of roles in the organization is actually doing them, right? Or AKA saving the team that I hired, this incredibly intelligent bunch. I mean, I, these 64 people and we're gonna grow about 20 people this year here at HQ, this is my family. Like these are, these are my, like I think about this group here as my, my Little brother and little sister, and I, and I say that because I believe that I'm their mentor, right? And I believe that it's my opportunity to make sure that there's an environment where they can come in and use the creativity and the intelligence and the imagination that had, God had given them, and then do so in an environment where there's no fear, where there's 
only the ability to grow and not the ability to die, right? Like if you make a mistake, you're not going to get buried for it. If you make a mistake and it's within the core values of the company and you had the right intentions and there was, and you're a great teammate and there's nothing malicious that you do, or there's, and your intent is pure, then you can make mistakes here all day long. You're never going to get a, you know, a come to Jesus talk unless you go outside of the lines of what the core values are or how we behave as a team, right? Our body language on the court. I used to, when I was a, a Central Michigan Chippewa, my biggest lesson I learned there was body language because my coach, my pitching coach, um, his name was Mike Villano, and he would teach me, uh, he would teach me how to just kind of calm myself down. I'm a, I'm a very energetic, outgoing, hands talking all the time person. I'll chirp at you if I'm playing sports against you. I'm a shit talker. That's just who I am. And, you know, it's part of the game. It's part of just who I am naturally, right? And so I had to really bring that in as a Central Michigan Chippewa and being one of our pitchers that got some real good game time was out in, you know, these conference games or non-conference games in front of scouts and representing the Chippewas, I needed to realize that I was not just representing myself anymore, uh, but more importantly, I was representing the team. And that attitude was a reflection of the team. So I used to get an umpire to call a a ball when I thought it should have been a strike and I would chirp at him and throw my hands up and roll my eyes and walk back to the mound and kick the dirt and shrug my shoulders and stare at him and you know that didn't do me any good because now he's just wanting to show me up now so next time I throw a a ball that's maybe uh, just on the outside of the strike zone he's not going to give it to me right he's not going to give it to me but if I just were stoic and I and I just went about my business and I didn't let it bother me, then I'm more likely to, I'm more likely to get some grace there. So body language is everything. And, and, um, and, and, and being a mentor for me is very important here. And I cannot, as a mentor, let my team not make mistakes. I can't have them I can't have them never learning pain or never experiencing pain to learn from that pain. Put it this way. It's like, if I'm constantly trying to save my teammates from making mistakes, that's an environment where they're not going to learn. I need to step back and let them trip, let them stumble, let them fumble. As long as it's not existential, right? My job is to give a directional conversation, right? And almost say like, hey, okay guys, here we go. We're going this direction. Everybody on board to go this direction and play this game? Great, all right. Now here's some giant sandboxes with some parameters right, that you can go play in, and I want you to play within that sandbox and in that direction uh, until you figure out solutions to problems, and I'm here for you. You cannot make enough mistakes, all right? You can't fail. That is my, op- that is my obligation as somebody that brings intelligent people together to reach a common goal, all right? Is, I don't want to save them like a parent might try to save a child from getting bullied at school by rather than teaching them how to stick up for themselves, right, by confronting, you know, the parents of the bully or the bully themselves or the principal and bailing their kid out, why don't you just teach your child how to deal with that bully, right? Listen, I'm not here to give you parenting advice, but what I teach my children, if somebody's bullying them, I teach them to use their words twice, say, hey, please don't do that, is the first one, hey, please don't do that, and then, and then, Tell your teacher, number two, okay? Number three, if that doesn't work and they put their hands on you again, pop them one right in the chest. Boom. And they are not going to mess with you anymore. The only kids that get picked on are the kids that are unwilling to stand up for themselves. And you see this in adulthood too. You see this in baseball locker rooms. This is like, I know my sports metaphors, but this is all I have. In the baseball locker room, it is a very back and forth bantering I would say alpha male environment. And if you're not able to banter back and forth and make fun of uh, your teammates or make fun of yourself along with you and pick on each other and have good comebacks, if you're the person that like people are picking on you, they start to gang up on you and you cower and you go underneath and you hide under your locker, well, you're going to be the target, right? And that's going to be the bond that some other guys on the team have is to pick on you and they show up every day doing that and it's not going to be a great environment. So I can't be the coach that walks in and says, hey, stop picking on 
you know, number 13. Like, stop picking on the guy that's over there cowering in the locker room. I need to be the coach that goes to the number 13 who's cowering in the locker room and say, hey, you come in my office. Hey, these guys are picking on you. What are you going to do about it? You got two choices. They're either going to keep picking on you or you can stand up for yourself and you can look them in the face and say, hey, you're not going to pick on me anymore, right? And they're going to laugh at you, right? And then you're going to tell them again and they're going to keep laughing at you and you're going to keep that up every day. What are you going to do? It's your choice. That's the job. That's the role of a great leader is to not save your team from failure. Make sure they experience that failure it will be painful for them, but that pain is how we learn, that pain is how we grow, and on the other side of that pain is a lesson that they'll carry with them for life because that pain will really emotionally emboss that moment. They're gonna have to step up and become somebody who they're not in order to deal with it, okay? Make sense? Okay, number three, don't let other people make decisions against your own to intuition. Okay, this is number three. Do not let other people make decisions against your own intuition. This is a, the juxtaposition to number two that basically says, let your team make mistakes. Don't save them for fi from failure. It's let them make mistakes. Yes, I maybe used this word once, but your job is to, like I said, give that direction and don't let other people give the direction. That's where you can go wrong. You've heard of the expression, too many cook, uh, cooks in the kitchen. That basically means nobody can make a decision. So if I don't come to the table and say, hey, here's the direction I'd like to go. Can anybody tell me why this isn't the best direction or the highest and best use of all of our time? Then I'm listening. But I'm not going to walk into a room and say, hey, what direction we should go or should we go? Okay. There's this classic story and this one I like to tell of uh, one of the most famous uh, modern day forest homes okay, that you could ever imagine. It's out in Oregon. And the story goes that there was a man, an artist, who was an architect, and he really needed just a clarity break. Life was getting at him. He lived in Portland. He's designing these buildings. They're big skyscraper buildings. And he's this person that just can look at an empty landscape or empty plot of real estate and just envision the most amazing buildings on it. The best there is in Portland, right? Okay, so he goes out to the woods somewhere in Salem, Kaiser, I believe, somewhere in that area, and goes out to the woods. He's sitting on a river. And he sees this beautiful opportunity, this beautiful plot of land. Most times homes, you know, neck real close to rivers. There's some circumstances that have to go into making it the best, most beautiful land possible. He looks at this one space and he says, oh, that's going to be the most beautiful forest home. Okay, he doesn't ask anybody if he should draw the forest home. He doesn't ask anybody if he should architect it. He doesn't go get a, a list of people who may be interested in forest homes. He sits down on the back of a... Uh, uh, the brown paper lunch bag that he had as he was hiking out in the forest and he sits down and he architects this beautiful forest home that feeds a waterfall into the river. It was just a beautiful landscape, beautiful architecture. And then what he did is he went into the city and he went to the richest areas in the city and he said, hey, uh, I know that you need a clarity break sometimes too. I'm a big designer in Portland. I build skyscrapers for a living. Here's some of my, here's some of my pictures. Here's some of my work. Listen, I know you need a clarity break too. I was out in the woods. This idea hit me. You wouldn't want me to build this for you, would you? Right? And he showed them this beautiful architecture. Well, he went to 20 homes, and by the time he got to 20 homes, he had sold, I think it was around a $3.5 million home, he had sold this home off the literal back of a napkin. Okay? So he didn't have all of the details. He didn't have all of the specs correct. He didn't have everything. He just had a direction. He said, hey... Here's my direction. You wouldn't want to go this way, would you? You wouldn't, wouldn't want to buy this thing, would you? You wouldn't want me to design this home for you, would you? Right? And it took him 20 people to find the right exact person that wanted to play that game. And then he already had a, uh, a direction. Now this person could come in behind him and they could work on it together and they could really build out the architecture for the home. So do you see what I'm saying? It's about giving the direction as a leader, having a direction, AKA this is why so many people talk about vision, have a vision, have a vision, right? I want to give you the strategy, the tactic on what that actually really means. It's not going around and taking someone else's vision. It's hitting yourself with inspiration, getting that spark, that aha moment, that thing that you would do for the rest of your life. If you had, would never get paid for it. It's tripling down on that as early in your life as you can. And then 
going to enough people and saying, hey, you wouldn't want to go this direction, would you? And when you do that, you're going to find your people. You're going to find the people that want to play your game. And when people want to play your game, there's inherit, uh, it's inherently more easy to build trust, to have loyalty, to build relationships that are going to last a long time. My number one goal as an entrepreneur is to have 20 to 40 VPs that have been with me for 20 years. I want people to see the future. I want them to have the direction, but I also want them to build the strategy. I want them to build the tactics, and then I want them to really go out and execute with my direction and my help and my mentorship when they need it. But I do not, I did not get into business to, or, or like I wouldn't get into a career either. This, like to me, an entrepreneurial mindset is what it takes. It, I don't care what organization you're in. I'm not getting into anything for a job. I'm not getting in, into anything so that I can trade my time for money. If I am getting a salary, I'm still not trading my time for money. I, I do get paid a salary by this organization. Um, some of you would be like, incredibly surprised by how little this organization pays me and how much I roll and invest back into the organization. I don't show up for that salary. I show up because I'm an owner of this company and I want to, I want to see how much impact that we can have. We're playing the game of how can we put a, a company in this industry which has traditionally been profit over people historically, almost with zero examples of the contrary, how do we get the top spot where it's people over profit, culture over profit. And that to me is the ultimate game. And so I'm going around saying, hey, this is the paradigm we are trying to shift. Here's what we're trying to do. Would you like to play this game with me? Would you like to play this game with me? This is not about money. This is about the impact. And then you can see everybody at HQ, which is a reflection of all 5,000 people in our organization, which is a reflection of the 120,000 people that are in and out of camps here in, in, uh, in uh, January in 2023. It's like, it starts with us. It starts with that direction. It is sh about shifting the paradigm. Okay, that is the direction. I don't care about being the most profitable. I care about being that number one spot, whether it's membership, it could be revenue, uh, it could be amount of locations, it could be amount of people that are working out, but I know that statistic, that metric, is going to be what it takes for us to have the ability to even begin changing the conversation because right now, if when we talk, and we talk about mental health and emotional health, and we talk about humility and empathy and, and positivity and optimism, this is not the stuff that the industry talks about. And so for us to be heard, we're gonna have to be so damn awesome at it that nobody can deny us. Nobody can take away the, our voice uh, as we go there because we all know negativity speaks a thousand times loud, louder than positivity, but we're gonna have the loudest positive voice and we're going to get the respect that's due to that positive voice by the results that we achieve. So the two are intertwined. It is culture and it is profit. And unfortunately, so many organizations go to profit and they don't realize that, hey, you know, like, what are you gonna do with a 50, 100, 500 million? What are you gonna do with a million dollars? Like, what are you gonna do with it? Once, you, once enough is enough, what are you gonna do with it? It's about changing your environment so that the people that come after you benefit from that. Like, that's what a legacy is, and that's, I think, what we're leaving. And so, hey, to wrap it up, these are just three, these are three tactical things, all right, for us. It's don't try to get out of the weeds. That's number one, okay? Number two, let your team make mistakes. Don't save them from failure. And number three, let other people make decisions against your own intuition. And then there's um, oh, sh oh, I said that, sorry. I said that wrong, sorry. I'm gonna do that one more time, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna rewind that, just so you guys have it, okay? I, I went off on a tangent, and I forgot my, uh, bring it back, Devin, this is what I do. Sometimes I'll just get lost in my little world, I gotta bring it back, okay. The, the title of the podcast is Three Tactical Pieces of Advice for Small Business Owners. Number one, don't try to get out of the weeds. Number two, let your team make mistakes. Don't try to save them from failure. And number three, let yourself make the directional decisions. Don't let other people set the vision. You set the vision, okay? And then there's 1,000, 1 million infinite other tactics that we could cover, but these are the ones that came to my mind in my drive over here this morning to speak with you. Thank you for being here. Make sure that you subscribe.
to the podcast. We have a visual on YouTube, all right? We also have uh, every podcast channel that you listen to. We are on at My Favorites Apple. Leave us a review, leave us a comment. I would love to know how these are impacting your life. We're dropping one every day or almost every single day. And uh, we enjoy doing it, we enjoy making it for you. I enjoy being able to show up first thing in the morning and spend a little bit of time with you. So thank you, this has been Ask Devin Anything. Don't forget to subscribe. Two claps on two, one, two.